this may be the last year we're here. Now, every preacher says that every year, but this may be the last year that we're here. And so, and so the, the fact is, is when you look back on, now, somebody wrote this, not me, but the other day that I thought it was humorous, is that after, after midnight on the 31st, it'll be the first time we can really say that hindsight is 2020. <laughs> I thought that somebody was pretty humorous when they wrote that. I, first time ever. <laughs> but I'm ready to look back on this year. You know? <laughs> so, so when we look forward to the next year then, I, I, I was thinking we ought to just make a plan early to just look forward and joy. You know, we have every day that we get up, we have a choice to either be down in the mouth and discouraged and let the world defeat us, or we can get up and expect joy that day. And I, I, I for one, think we ought to look forward to joy. And while I was thinking on that, I was thinking about the, the song that we sing in uh, Christmas time that we sing today was Joy to the World. And actually, joy to the world is not about Christmas. It's not about the advent of Jesus Christ. It's not about the, the, uh, the, the incarnation of Christ. If you read the words, joy to the world is about the second coming. It's about the time when he will return uh, and he will, his feet will touch the Mount of Olives and it will split. And we go into the millennium. If you read that, it's, it's about him on the throne, about Jesus on the throne, and about the curse being removed from the earth. And the last time I looked, we still need rain. I don't think the curse has been removed yet. But, uh, but, the, but the thing is, is that uh, we, you know, we sing songs that are seasonal like that. But if you study that one, you can, you can worship the Lord for the fact that he is coming again. And he is going to be that answer to everything. When the curse is lifted, when there is no more sorrow, no more death, all of that is, all of that is there. Read the words to that song sometime and, and when we sing it. Don't mean we have to quit singing it on Christmas, but what it does mean is when you do, think about the fact that he's coming again, and that he is going to be on the throne, and you and I are going to be there all around the throne with him. And so let's let's praise the Lord for that. So I was thinking of that, and that's where the, the, the idea came with joy, that we need to just look forward to joy, and that's exactly what it says. Ecclesiastes 5, 18 through 20 says, even so, I have noticed one thing, at least, that is good. It is good for people to eat and drink and to enjoy the, their work under the sun during the short life God has given them, and to accept their lot in life. And it is a good thing to receive wealth from God and a good health to enjoy it, to enjoy your work and to accept your lot in life. This is indeed a gift from God. God keeps such people so busy enjoying life that they take no time to brood over the past. I just I think that is a tremendous way to look at the year coming up. Let's just get so busy praising the Lord and thanking the Lord and, and living in the joy that we don't have to worry about what happened this last year. Let's just let's just do this. You know what? The the, the past isn't there anymore. The future hasn't come yet. Let's just let's just thank God for the day and serve Him in the day. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, again, we come to you and thank you. And I always want to start making sure that uh, that as we come before you, Lord, that I confess to you that, Lord, I cannot do this. I cannot preach this sermon. I cannot hold the Word of God. It is too powerful for me. It is too it is too much for me. But Lord, I thank you that you can. I thank you that the Holy Spirit of God can take it and deliver this to the people that are sitting here in front of us today. And Father, that as we as we work together to bring this out, that they would hear it with spirit-filled ears, as well as spirit-filled preaching, Lord. Let, let this be heard with spirit-filled ears. And that we would be able to have a day that we could say it was good to be in the house of God. In Jesus' name, amen. 
So this is how God's going to keep us busy enjoying life. Okay? 1 Peter 1.8 in the ESV says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is unexpressible and filled with glory. So when we look at our lives, we ought to be praising him and be thanking him that we have, even though we don't, uh, aren't able to see him and be able to be right there in his presence, yet we can rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and full of glory. And that's what we need to do. We need to just not worry about the fact that we are not directly in his presence yet, but that we live in his presence by faith and that we allow that to happen and in our lives. Salvation brings joy by giving the Christian freedom from sin. Salvation brings joy through the, our life in Christ. And salvation brings joy through the sealing of the Christian by the Holy Spirit and giving him the fruit of the Spirit. And so our salvation expresses joy in all three phases of our Christianity. Salvation will bring it. Salvation will keep you in joy. And salvation will give you a future of joy if you'll just allow the Holy Spirit to do that through you. And so I'm asking you today to look at, look at the evidence of what I just said. And we'll put it up on screen. And you look at God's verses in, in the Bible. And you look at the Word of God. And you determine for yourself. Because if God said it, it's true. It doesn't matter what you think about it. Okay, it, it, he's always going to be right, and you might as well just get in line with what he says, and you'll be okay. Okay, so first of all, we have joy through our salvation. All right, so what is, when does that happen? He says in Habakkuk 3.18, he says, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Romans 8.1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And so we know that, you know, obviously if there is no condemnation for anything that was passed, I for one can say, thank you Lord, that's not there anymore. I, I for one can say, if there is going to be absolutely no one holding that over me that makes any difference, then I can be joyful in that. And listen, if you come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you have put your faith and trust in the blood of Jesus Christ, He wipes the sin debt that was there out. But He also wipes the guilt out if you will allow Him to. And I do mean it that way, because not only do we get saved and, 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 and see our sins forgiven, we have to live saved in a sense that we no longer allow that to come back up. You see, because the truth is, the condemnation that a lot of people, that, that is, one is talking about, that a lot of people struggle over living that life of a, a lack of condemnation, is because, number one, they hear the old voices that are gone, and they allow them to come back and harass them today. That's one way. The other way is, is Satan hates you. And he will bring it back up over and over and over, even though Jesus has already saved you. Even though Jesus has already provided the forgiveness of that sin, and whatever it is that, will, that always embarrasses you, I like to tell people, go back to your salvation in your mind. The day that you bowed your knee, in, even in your heart, and said, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner, forgive me of my sins and save me. Go back to that moment. You realize that anything that you have done before that is gone. Because my Bible says it is by the blood of Jesus Christ, by faith in his blood, that we are declared righteous. There's nobody righteous but one. Jesus even told the rich man that. Why do you call me good? There's none good but God. And we say, well, how come we can claim that then? Because whenever you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, He not only forgave your sins, 
but he put you in Christ. And those of you that go to church here all the time, probably tired of hearing that. Guess what? It's not over. I'm never going to quit. Okay? You are in Christ. And at that moment, when God sees you, he does not see the sin that you may have just committed. He sees Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ has... He's, he's perfect. You say, well, I wish I could say that about me. Get on board. But the truth is, the only reason he can is because Satan loves to lie to you and tell you that it still matters. What this verse says, and I believe my Bible more than I believe his, his, uh, his accusations, but my Bible says there is now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. So if somebody is, de is, is, is declaring condemnation over you, you tell them, stop. I have been paid for. I have been bought with the most precious commodity there ever was on this earth. And that's the blood of Jesus Christ. And you, Satan, have no right to tell me anything. Okay? You are a child of God. You are not just a child of God. You are a child of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and every bit of what you are is bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. If you just put your faith and trust in Him and live like it, we're going to talk about that, live like it, then you too can have freedom from those accusations because you've been bought and paid for. So a person who, get this now, a person who cannot uh, let, me, let me start over. A person who is not saved cannot experience the Spirit-filled life. Cannot. And a person who is saved but not living in joy will not. He will not live in a Spirit-filled condition if he allows his joy to go away. Why? Because the joy that we have is, and I'm going to jump a verse on you, Becky, Galatians 5.22. The joy that we have is not your own. He says, but the fruit of the, who? The fruit of the Spirit is love. What's the next word? Joy. joy. Oh, wait a minute. The fruit that was given to you belongs to the one who gave it to you. Right? He gave it to you. As he gives it to you, it's his joy. It's his love. It's his peace. It's his long-suffering, his patience. So those of you that said, I'm just impatient. No, no, God gave you a gift of patience. Now start practicing it. Okay? God gave you peace. Now practice it. God gave you joy. Now practice it. God gave you un absolutely unredeemable love. He gave you everything you need. That's probably the wrong word. And he gave you the, the unconditional love. Let's use that word. He gave it to you. Now all you have to do is practice it. Live in it. Rejoice in it. Gentleness. Goodness. Faith. These are things that were not yours. But God, through the Holy Spirit's power at your salvation, gave them to you. And you have, as you live in Him, the power to produce that fruit. Now, this I'm not going to go into this because this is a sermon of its own. But just think about this. If you are embedded and in, rooted into the Holy Spirit, and the ground that you are planted in is God's ground, and you have roots into Him, then the flow of the Holy Spirit up through your trunk of your tree and out into your branches, if it remains unrestricted, you will produce fruit just as much as an apple, fruit, an apple tree will produce apples if it's given a good soil, and the good soil of God is more than you need, and it's given the, the sap running freely into those branches. And let me tell you, the sap of the Holy Spirit is more powerful than anything you've ever experienced before in your life. And so if you'll just allow that to happen, the fruit of these things will show up on your branches. You'll live in love. 
You'll live in peace. You'll live in joy. You'll live in that goodness. And you'll live in patience. You say, I'm just, I just can't live it. And you're not letting him. You don't have to do nothing. That's probably not good English, but that's all right. <laughs> you don't have to do anything but just allow God to flow freely through you. Okay? John 16, 22, back it up one. Also, you have sorrow now. Boy, we can say that about this year. There's sorrow. There's pain. There's things we didn't want to face. There's people gone that we didn't want to lose. There, is, there are people who, are, who have wandered away from God and wandered away from our families. There are people who have, who have gotten caught up in the things they shouldn't be into. He says, and also you will have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice. There's joy. And no one will take your joy from you. You believe that? You believe that God can give you joy that no one can take away? I'm going to tell you something. Nobody on this earth has the right to take your joy. Satan has no right to take your joy. But you can give it away. You can give it. You, you can let Satan have it. You just say, here, I, I, I don't want patience. Here, I don't want joy. Here, I, I, I don't. You, you can't. You take it. You don't want him to do with it. He'll make it so that you, it's no good for you to use it anymore. Because he destroys everything. He's only come to kill and to steal and to destroy. Therefore, don't let him have that territory that God has given you. And the territory that God has given you is love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering. All of those words, okay? So goodness, gentleness, faith, all of those things come with your salvation. So praise God for that. Joy also Joy through your life in Christ. Let me, let me put this this way. Learning to live in joy in your Christian life is a habit that you have to develop. You have to, you know what? When you get into a bad habit, you have to do it a few times and all of a sudden it took over. What we have to realize in our lives is, is that learning to live in the joy of our Christian lives is also a habit. Therefore, you have to practice it. You have to shun the things that destroy your joy, and you have to do the things that bring joy into your lives. And only you can do that. Mama can't do it. Your wife can't do it. Your kids can't do it for you. You've got to do it yourself. And so it, it, it's, I, I call it keeping short accounts on with God. We, we have short accounts. In other words, you go to the co-op, and Matt knows, he's got, a, he's got a, a roster and what you owe next to it. You want to keep short accounts with the co-op. Then you've got to do things that will pay that account off. Okay, does that make any sense to anybody but me? It's just that simple. It's not about anything huge or, 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 or hard to understand. You have an account with Christ. You have an account with God. And, and someday I'll, I'll preach a sermon that I call God's tally list. But let's just, let's just talk about it this way. In your true position in Christ... If you learn to live in Christ, then it becomes second nature to be in Christ. If you live in the world and pay your attention to the world, the world will be who interacts with you more. Is that, I, I, I know I'm trying to say this right, but let's just put it this way. Live in humility to practice your Christian life. Live in humility. That means being able to say, I'm wrong when I'm wrong. That means that when my wife is right, I can say so to her. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> I 
and she him to me too, okay? <laughs> all right, then, then I'll never read, okay? But the bottom line to all of this is you have to learn to live in it. And in the sense of living in Christ, you have to learn to tattletale on yourself. You remember tattletales in elementary school? You know, whenever you did something wrong on the playground and the, you didn't get back to the building before the teacher knew it. She didn't have eyes in the back of her head. She had tattletales that helped. Okay? Well, in this sense, you tattletale on yourself. The way to live in humility is tell God about what you did wrong before anyone else gets a chance to. Whenever you've made a mistake, confess it. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, righteous, if you will, to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we just tell on ourselves, that's what the word means. To, to confess means to agree with God that you did something wrong. Just tell it. Boom. Okay? It's pretty, it's pretty hard to live a lie and to hide things if you're telling on yourself all the time. And that's what you need to do because it's part of learning to practice to live the Christian life. So when you tell on yourself, God says he will cleanse you from all that unrighteousness. Now, here's another thing, though. If you have truly repented, and you that's a different matter. You can, you can admit you're a sinner and never repent. Because if you're going down the road this way, and you're sinning, and God puts it on your heart that you need to change... You can say, you're right, God, I, I know I should. That's just confession. But it's when you stop and turn around and go home and turn around and go back to the Father. That is when you have repented. And repentance is what it's all about. So if you haven't truly repented, you, you, don't, you haven't even started down this life yet. But repentance is when you realize, I go down here, I tell him, God, I'm a sinner. And then I turn around and I don't go back. For 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. And new life has begun. To go back to what you were involved in before in 2 Peter 2.22 he says they prove the truth of a proverb when they say a dog returns to his vomit and another one says a washed pig returns to the mud you know what I'm talking about there is a gross truth that happens when a dog just being a dog Okay, I don't need to go into it, but I'm just saying it's the same. What what feeling do you feel when you think about a dog going back to his vomit? It's, it's sickening. It is when you go back to your sinful ways too, because God forgives you and you've turned around. For Pete's sake, don't turn back around and go back to that old life. There's no sense in it. There's nothing that is back there. You don't want anything down that road. You know what was down that road. You've seen it and you've turned away from it. Then don't go back. So what do you do? Well, my wife has a, 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 a blog that, that she uses this statement for. And it is crawling into God's lap. And what the name it says is, when we live our lives... The way God wants us to, you will find yourself very often crawling up into God's lap, laying your head back down into his chest, and feeling the warmth of God, and feeling the very presence of God. And I believe that if you can get close enough, you can smell the smell of God, and you can be there and let him put his arms around you like any good father would, and I have told my daughters, and I'm just human, 
But I have told my daughters they will never outgrow my laughter. Now, I told them that when they were this big. You know what they do when they come home? They crawl over into my easy chair, and they crawl up into my lap, and they hug on me, and they're 40 years old. That's something that's never going to go away. That's never going to be a time when they can't do that. When my daddy was on his deathbed, he was just this far from taking his last breath. My youngest daughter came in that hospital room, crawled up in her popo's arms, and he was unconscious, he was in a coma, and she sang to him for an hour. She sang every song of praise and every old gospel hymn that she could think of. And she didn't just whisper it. The nurses in the nurse stand got to hear it. She put on a concert for about a half of a wing of people, I think. But she was telling God how much that meant for her to be able to crawl up into his arms. Listen, that was just my earthly father. That was just her grandpa. What's it like to crawl into God's lap? How important is it that we come to the end of our rope and we just crawl up into God's arms, crawl up into his lap, and let him carry us through that time? She did a better job of it than I did when he, when he took his last breath because it hurt so bad. I had a hard time. I had a hard time with it for a while. She showed me and reminded me what it was like to crawl up into God's lap and to give it to him. And no man can take God's place when it comes to that. He'll love you. He will honor your feelings. He will let you pour out your feelings. You say, well, it's not very manly to crawl up there in God's lap and, and cry. Then go get in your pickup and drive up somewhere in the edge of a field somewhere where you're not going to have to put up with other people, but what you do need to put up with is you need to put up with what you and God need to deal with when you're feeling that way. Nobody else needs to hear it. Matthew 6, 6 says, But when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. Then your Father who sees everything will reward you. God wants you to crawl up into his lap. Listen, this is about living in joy. We said salvation brings you the joy that God gives as the fruit of the Holy Spirit. I'm saying then once you're there, you've got to practice, practice, practice. And that means you get, you tell on yourself often, you, you drop your, your pride and you crawl up into God's lap and you let him heal what you need healed. And listen, he's big enough. And there isn't anybody on this earth. There isn't a priest. There isn't a preacher. There isn't anybody that has to hear what you have to say. It's okay if you want to share it with somebody. But the truth is, is what needs to happen is between you and God. And God needs to hear it. He needs your voice saying and admitting the things he's laying on your heart. Third thing. Close to done. You learn joy through a spirit-filled life. The Holy Spirit needs to fill you. And by filling you, I bring this distinction in my own. Once you are given over to the Holy Spirit through, through my Bible says, and we're going to read the verses on it, but my Bible says that when I come to Jesus Christ as Savior, He baptized me into the Holy Spirit, okay? The Holy Spirit takes me then and baptizes me into the church and I have a forever home, okay? Now, that this is just the way we, we look at it. This is the way I like to look at it. And that is to say that living the Christian life, if it takes practice, then I want all the power I can get. And that doesn't mean that God's going to short me with the Spirit it means that I can close off and not let the Spirit have all of me. 
You see, he's there ready to, he's already given me everything he needs to give me. The problem with the, with the lack of a spirit-filled life is when you don't give over to him and allow him to have your life. It's when you say, oh God, you can, you can have this room and this room and this room of my heart, but you know this room that I keep all my junk in? You can't have that room. You limit God, you limit the Holy Spirit, and that don't work. He wants all of you. He wants your rooms that you don't that you're not proud of. He wants the rooms that you're ashamed of. He wants the rooms that you're gladly to give it to him, your worship, your praise, your Bible reading. But what about those deep dark secrets that you have? He wants them too. The Holy Spirit needs all of you. And he says to you right now to come and drink of the living waters of the Holy Spirit. Romans 14, 17 says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1, 13 through 14 says, In Him you also, when you have heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, in Him when you believed, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. He is the down payment of the inheritance for the redemption of the possession to the praise of His glory. It's just like this. It's just it's, it's the way I teach the children. Okay, if you imagine that's you and you're saved, it's an endless circle, right? So the endless circle tells me it's a perfection. It's going round and round. When you get saved, you are placed into Jesus' hands. John 10, 27. Place me into Jesus' hand. And who's able to pluck, him, pluck you out of Jesus' hand? No one. He says, the night, day that, he says, and then God puts you both into his hand. Now that's God the Father. And he says, and no one's able to pluck you out of the Father's hand. And the two of them are one. But then this verse says that the two of you, the, of the three of you, I should say, are then sealed into the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit seals you in to Christ. You're in Christ. You're in God the Father. Now the Holy Spirit seals the whole thing until the day that you are truly redeemed in heaven. And guess what? There's not a person, there's not a thing, there's nothing about this world that can take you out of your Father's hand, out of Jesus' hand, nor can it break the seal of the Holy Spirit on your life. So what you have to do is learn to live rejoicing. And that's why I say, look back on 2020 and say, wow, what a year. Look forward to 2021 in joy. I don't know what's over there either. I don't care. I'm going to be living in joy in the Holy Spirit of God. I want to live and be filled with the Holy Spirit. That word to be filled in Ephesians 5, 18 and 19 when it says don't be drunk with wine but be filled with the Holy Spirit. That word filled is a, it is a constant, continual, repetitive verb. In other words, you don't just do it once. It's over and over and over and over and over and over and over. Constantly being filled by the Holy Spirit and, 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 and look at what you get to do. You know, singing songs and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, making music to the Lord in your heart. The act of immersion in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit ministry cannot be achieved by any part of yours. You can't build it up, you can't fake it, you can't earn it. All you can do is just say, whew, here it is. And live in it. Let the Spirit have every room in your life. Let the Spirit like baptism. Okay? When you got baptized, at least in, in, in this church, when you got baptized, you got dumped under, right? You got immersed. When you get immersed in the Holy Spirit, you're getting there. That's when you get to stay immersed in the Holy Spirit of God. Let that filling take you and let him let it be something that you live your life constantly, repetitively, allowing him to fill you 
and to baptize you into that position where you are full of the Holy Spirit and then watch for the fruit to come. You remember I told you your fruit will come by nature? It will. It's just the same verses we read before. But this time you see it as the Holy Spirit power in you because of your position in Christ and your baptism into the Holy Spirit of God and you are soaking it all up and the fruit just automatically comes. And what will you see? You'll see that love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, goodness and self-control. When you're living in the Holy Spirit, the fruit will be evident. And when you're not living in the Holy Spirit, your fruit will be evident. My Bible says, by your fruits, you shall know them. Whenever they produce fruit, you can see who, who, what they're like. Okay? Mark it down. When they're living in the Holy Spirit, when they're living in Christ, it'll be joy. It'll be all these things. And when you're not feeling that in your life, it's because you've shut him off somewhere in your life. You better go back and find out where you, where you shut him off and open that passage back up and let him have it. Let him have all. My advice for 2021 is just simply this. Look for the joy. Look for the joy and stay there. Live it. 